Message from Rhonda Brown this afternoon. The reason Rhonda's not here tonight, um, and I, I don't have a name, but an Oakville High School teacher has died. And uh, uh, I don't know whether illness or an accident was involved, but uh, it happened this weekend. And uh, so Rhonda is interacting with other staff members this evening, but uh, certainly would appreciate our prayers. Uh, with her and for the family. I apologize that I can't give more information. It may be that she wasn't able to provide any more than that at this point. A um, couple of other things. I got a text from Susan Lauer, and Larry's coming home tomorrow. And, uh, so uh, after, uh, after four and a half weeks in uh, the hospital and rehab, uh, he's getting to go home tomorrow, and that's good news. Um, 
I'll, um, I'll say more in just a moment. Tonight's pizza night. I've been up all afternoon making those pizzas. I hope, hope you enjoy them. Uh, somebody asked, why are they all thin crust? Because I like thin crust. If you like thick crust, you go get them next time. <laughs> anyway, there's, uh, there's hamburger and pepperoni. There, if you didn't discover them already, kind of on the back, there are a couple of, of uh, mushroom and onion for you vegetarians or vegans. Uh, there, there are a couple, well, no, they, that wouldn't be a vegan because it's got cheese on it. But anyway, um, then uh, uh, there's just a cheese pizza, and then there are some sausage pizzas for you spicy folks. So uh, trying to get a little something for everybody. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you to everyone who brought the other things tonight to go with pizza. I saw several chocolate chip items up there for which I am always grateful. Thank you. A um, couple of things that, uh, uh, that we uh, shared this morning. One is that two weeks from now, just to remind you, we're having Rebellion Sunday. Now, for those of you who go to more wayward churches, <laughs> what that means is that the Sunday of time change, we don't. Uh, we come to Sunday school and church on the old time, set our clocks up after church on Sunday afternoon, and it's not nearly as painful. So anyway, uh, that's coming up in just a couple of weeks. Um, next Sunday night, and I, I, in fact, I'll, I'll just reveal, okay? Give me a little da-da-da. <laughs> next Sunday night is soup night so bring your favorite soup next Sunday night if you will and uh, and we'll mix and mingle and and enjoy soup together so uh, that's for next week okay that's what I wanted to share with you again thank you to those who uh, brought the food to go along with the pizza and uh, hope you're enjoying it. let's pray together and uh, Johnny, are you ready to lead us in some singing? Yes, sir. Good. Let's bow our heads and pray. David, would you lead our prayer, please, sir? Yes, sir. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to meet and have fellowship in your name. Lord, we thank you for all the good things you do for us. We pray, Lord, that tonight our hearts will be sensitive to your word and be with Brother John as he uh, discusses and brings what you have for him to say. We pray, Lord, that we'll just uh, take this time to realize how this affects us in everyday life here in 2019, Lord. We thank you that your word is alive and that it works through us. Just be with us now and bless this time of singing and fellowship and studying your word. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. I want to say welcome and thank you for tuning in to those who may be watching on Facebook either tonight or coming back later in the week to watch it. I appreciate, um, Tony, that we can reach out to folks in this way. And, um, and something that I have not said recently, so let me just remind everyone, if you attend one of our studies and something in the PowerPoint intrigues you, you are always welcome to email me and say, hey, I'd like a copy of that PowerPoint, and I will always be willing to share those, okay? Um, so, um, so just keep that in mind. And so for folks that may be watching on Facebook, I'm always willing. You just need to email me. It's jlhessel at aol.com, and uh, you'll find me, and I'll I'll give it to you. Okay, Johnny, let's sing together. Yes, sir. Still hanging on to that aol.com. Yeah, well, well that's me. That's me too. I, I, we, I think we're the only two on the planet. Anyway, uh, hey, uh, uh, if you would turn to 429. Have any of you wondered why we sing? Has anyone ever wondered why we sing? Maybe not. Anyway, this song tells us, and, and tells us so, uh, join as we sing, Why Do I Sing About Jesus? <laughs>
you turn to 505, 505, we're marching to Zion. Larry because he loves institutional food. <laughs> when Rich and I went to see him the other night, that was the that was the big issue. Okay. Um, I should mention something else, and this is for our Lime friends. <coughs> Two weeks from tonight, we have our quarterly business meeting, and you all are more than welcome to join us and, and sit in on that. However, um, uh, we will not be doing one of the Revelation letters that night. So uh, next week, we'll be doing Sardis. And then the following week, um, what would that be, the 17th, we'll do uh, Philadelphia. And the 24th, we'll do Laodicea. And David made a good observation. He suggested that we ought to set the menu to kind of match the letter. So uh, we've agreed on, on the Laodicea night. We're going to have ice cream, but we're going to leave it set out all afternoon, so uh, it'll be neither cold nor hot. You can enjoy it. Okay. Oh, my God. Oh, oh God. Oh, God. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Listen, if you pay more, you'd get better jokes. Okay. okay. All right. We're, uh, we're taking up the fourth of the seven churches tonight. Uh, it is the letter to the church at Thyatira. Now, interestingly enough, uh, Thyatira was the smallest of the seven churches and the smallest community of the seven communities. But interestingly enough, it is also the longest letter 
uh, that was written. So that's just uh, an interesting side note. We have said as we've gone along each night that there are several issues that we need to keep in mind when we study the book of Revelation. And those are particularly pertinent when we study the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. So I just list them once again for you to be reminded. And then uh, I've always included the scripture from chapter 1 that is the basis for this correspondence with these churches. And, uh, and so uh, John says, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance, which are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Okay? And so I reminded you who John is, and it's important to keep that in mind. Um, and it is entirely uh, understandable why God would have chosen John to be the channel of this revelation. Um, and uh, given John's character, given John's role in the church, given the, fa given the fact that he is the last uh, surviving apostle and perhaps the sole surviving personal witness to the resurrected Christ. So uh, we come then to consider the letters, and I had shared this with you. And so uh, we're looking at Thyatira right here. And again, we started at Ephesus, and we're simply making a circuit. Okay, and uh, you'll see over here it is a center for crafts and trade. And I mentioned Lydia. We'll say more a little little more about that in just a moment. Okay, there is a modern-day city called Axar that is built around the ruins of ancient Thyatira. The city of Thyatira, like most of the other cities that we've studied, does not exist in its first-century form, does not exist either by its first-century name or under its first-century structure. So um, the modern-day city is Axar, and these are ruins from that first century uh, city, but behind it you see all of these apartment complexes and other modern buildings. And um, so uh, what Thyatira was known for uh, is uh, uh, coins, uh, crafts, guilds, uh, linen weavers, bronze workers, potters, and bakers. And so uh, we might say that Thyatira was a blue collar town. Okay, uh, some years ago, um, had the opportunity to serve as interim pastor for a couple of years of a church in Granite City. And uh, I had come from a church in Southern Illinois and had, had joined uh, First Concord Baptist Church and then South County Baptist Church here in South County and went from there over to this church in Granite City. And it was a totally different culture than what I was accustomed to in churches where I had been previously or where I was a member here in St. Louis because Granite City is essentially a union blue collar town and their churches operate that way. And to some measure, at least in the church where I was, there were people who took orders all week so they wanted to give orders on Sunday. And there was just a different mindset, okay? And so, um, uh, Thyatira was that kind of a blue collar town. Now, I grew up in Alton. There's nothing more blue collar than Alton. And so I'm not saying that in a critical way. That's simply an observation that sometimes the way folks look at things, um, their ethos is a little different uh, in, that, in that format. Okay, in the book of Acts, Lydia was a wealthy benefactress and convert to Christianity. We'll see that in just a moment. She was a seller of purple cloth. And one of the things that Thyatira was known for was uh, manufacturing and selling different dyes. And according to scholars, purple dye was particularly expensive, and that's why purple fabric was considered more preserved for royalty. Okay? 
Uh, it was a high dollar color, for lack of another way to, uh, uh, to say it. So, the ancient coins of Thyatira show a multitude of guilds, including linen weavers, bronze workers, potters, and bakers. Thyatira was the only city of the seven churches built on flat ground without natural defenses, making it vulnerable to attack. If you remember, I told you last week that Pergamum sat up on a, on a hill, actually on what we would call today a mesa, up above the landscape. And the interesting thing is, Pergamum, because it was the regional capital, would put a garrison of soldiers at Thyatira because they would hit Thyatira first, and that's how Pergamum would know the trouble's coming. And, and so that's the kind, and that meant that Thyatira was overrun and was destroyed and rebuilt numerous times over a period of five or six hundred years. So that also played into um, the social fabric, shall we say, of Thyatira. Uh, in John's vision, Jesus is described with feet like burnished, burnished bronze, a metaphor Thyatira citizens would have easily grasped because of its bronze workers. Some of their coins were made of bronze. And their value of those coins was not in the metal in the coin itself, but in the image that was on the coin and their guarantee of the worth of that. It's kind of like Confederate money, okay? Uh, Confederate money had no value, uh, uh, you know, as long as, as uh, the, federal, uh, the Confederate government was there, they would guarantee that this paper is worth that much. But when the Confederacy collapsed, uh, the worth of that was no more than the paper it was printed on. So uh, just to give you that thought about ancient money. Okay, I mentioned about Lydia of Thyatira. Lydia is important for essentially three reasons. One, because she was originally from Thyatira, but that's not where we find her. We find her in the city of Philippi, and if you recall, uh, Paul was, was at Troas, and, which is in Turkey, uh, or ancient Asia Minor, and he received a vision saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And so when he went across to Macedonia, uh, he says, we put out to sea, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and on the day following to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. And we were staying in this city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. Now, to have a synagogue in your city, you had to have 10 adult males. If you did not have 10 men who would commit to that synagogue, they could not have one. And so in Philippi, because there were not 10 men who would stand together to create a synagogue, the women of that city would gather, and in this case, you know, we think of a park today, they gathered down by the river for a prayer meeting. Paul went to pray with them. And so it was not unusual at all, and in fact, if you look at Paul's letters, Frequently, when Paul went to a city, he would go first to the synagogue. He would find where the Jewish people in that town gathered, and he would gather with them. So what it's saying here is there was no synagogue to go to, so he went where he thought there might be some folks gathering for prayer. Among those, as we read on, was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God who was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Now, the phrase, a worshiper of God, what does that mean? Anybody recognize what that means? Jewish? No, just the opposite. She was not Jewish. She was a convert to Judaism or a proselyte. Uh, and that was the name for a Gentile who had been exposed to the Jewish faith and had been uh, essentially invited in or had sought their way in to the Jewish faith. It was not that uncommon, okay? Uh, think of the Ethiopian eunuch, for example. 
uh, and, and uh, there are other examples of those who were converts to Judaism that, uh, that were like that. And the phrase that identifies many of those folks is that phrase, a worshiper of God. Okay? Uh, the only reason that Luke would have used that phrase is because she wasn't Jewish. If she was Jewish, there would have been no reason to even say that. Okay? So just a side note. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. And so I said there were three things that make Lydia important to us. Number one, she was from Thyatira. Number two, she met Paul in Philippi, and as you see in the heading there, she was the first convert in, on the continent of Europe to the gospel. Okay, And so that makes Lydia unique and special in that sense. And the third thing, uh, third thing is that she became a benefactor of Paul. And, uh, and so we believe that Lydia physically supported Paul and, and uh, uh, his traveling companions there in Philippi. We believe that later Lydia uh, actually sent money or, or supported him financially. So she continued to support his work, having been herself uh, converted to the gospel. Now, anybody have a question or a comment about Lydia of Thyatira? Okay. One of the things that those of us that have been in church a long time know is that sometimes God sends to us special people with special abilities or special interests to help us and to equip us to do the things God wants us to do. And down through the years, it has amazed me how God provides folks with those special skills just when we need those special skills. And uh, I could give you countless examples, um, but Tony, one of them's you, okay? Uh, God knew that you were not technologically challenged, but I was, and you were suffering for it. And so God blessed us with Tony. Uh, some years ago, when I was at South County Baptist Church, we had a group of folks in our church who really had a burden on their heart to begin a children's ministry that we call Awana, okay? Um, and uh, having been a pastor for 30 some years, these folks were coming to me and asking me about Awana, and I was explaining to them, I don't know anything about Awana. And lo and behold, Peabody Coles, uh, Cole uh, transferred one of their uh, superintendents to St. Louis to the home office of Peabody, and he and his wife lived out here in Jefferson County, and they joined our church. And guess what? In two different churches where they had been, they had organized and guided Awana programs. Now, if the folks came to me and said, we want an Awana, that would have been one thing. If the folks came to me and said, we want to start an Awana, that would have been a different thing. But when the folks came to me that wanted it, and the folks came to me that knew how to start it, I perked up and listened. And we had an Awana ministry that was reaching, what, somewhere 90 to 100 kids. I don't know how it's doing now. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, my point is that, uh, and, and we'll deal with this on Sunday morning here in a few weeks. You heard me talk about this morning spiritual gifts. Um, uh, I learned a long time ago Spiritual gifts are not just talents that we shop for. I genuinely believe that there is a spiritual dimension in which God equips his church and his people for the things God wants them to do. And, uh, and so uh, Lydia of Thyatira is important in that regard. She is an asset to God's kingdom, and had she not been... Uh, a supporter of Paul, who knows uh, how it may have limited Paul's ministry down the road or how it may have limited what Paul was able to establish there in Philippi. So, okay. Question or comment? All right. So these are just some examples. The, the ruins of Thyatira were very limited compared to some of the other cities 
uh, of, the, uh, uh, of that era and, uh, in Asia Minor. And so what we're seeing are things, and as you can see, there's weeds growing up. It's not protected or preserved. It just basically is there. And they built the town around it, a town of 100,000 people. They did have an arena there. Uh, this is that wall that we saw earlier. And these are simply uh, the, uh, uh, the remains of some of their civic buildings. But as you can see, the town has surrounded it. Okay? So that's modern Akashar. Okay. Jesus warned those in Thyatira who were tolerating the deceptive teaching of someone called Jezebel, an unrepentant influencer or perhaps a symbol for the licentiousness that led people into Satan's deep secrets, they're called. Few in Thyatira had remained true to the faith, and Jesus encouraged them to hold on. We'll see that in verse 25. He promised authority over nations to those who persevere until the end. The scant ruins of Thyatira are unearthed in the modern city of Akasar with more than 100,000 people. Contemporary apartment buildings line streets teeming with buses and cars. There is no church in Akashar. And, or excuse me, and no known believers. So, you know, it has been 2,100 years, but even then, there is tragedy in, in that assessment. Okay? All right. So, here's another picture, and these are examples of some of the coins that they fashioned. And uh, I'll have to be honest with you. I don't know, as I was doing research some days ago, I found that picture, and I don't know if that's supposed to be Lydia or if that's supposed to be the Jezebel of which we hear. Uh, so she is, she's there. She can be whatever you want her to be. Okay, I have reminded you as we look at each of these letters in Revelation, there is a, a common structure, okay? Uh, these eight different uh, categories, shall we say, uh, that occur in each of the letters. And it helps us to study the letters comparatively uh, uh, because of that structure. So, the message to Thyatira. Can I ask for someone to read it so you don't have to listen to me the whole time? And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and its feet are like burnished bronze, say this. I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray, so that they commit acts of immortality, immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. Okay. Continue, if you would, please. And I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who do not, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them. I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds again, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. As I also have received authority from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right. Thank you, David. You have a good voice, and you have keen eyes. <laughs> Thank you. that for us. Okay. So this is the letter to Thyatira. By sheer word count, it is the longest of the seven letters, okay? So it begins with the commission, 
to the angel of the church in Thyatira write. And the description of, of Jesus, and these are all drawn from, from chapter 1, but this one, the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this. And so as was noted in the earlier comment, uh, commentary, uh, to mention to Thyatira about having fire and burning bronze would have been very familiar to them, okay? And uh, uh, I grew up around the Alton Steel Mill and uh, uh, the Alton Glass Works and, and some other businesses, industries over there. And so it was not unusual at all to be driving down Broadway in Alton at eight or nine o'clock at night and the sky would literally light up when they poured that uh, molten uh, steel out of those uh, huge uh, buckets, I'll call them. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, folks would relate to that, would identify to that. Again, these are descriptives that John is recycling from his vision of Jesus in chapter 1. But there's something else to this, okay? And as some commentators, the reason I've underlined eyes and feet, because eyes suggest that he has the knowledge of what the problem is and the feet to do something about it, okay? And, uh, and so he prints it, uh, presents himself to them in that strength. His commendation is a little bit unusual in a couple of ways. And again, forgive my underlining, but wanted to call attention. He gives actually, if you would, a laundry list of the things that he commends or compliments the church in Thyatira for having. Their deeds, their love, their faith, which actually should translate faithfulness, okay? Their service and their perseverance, which could also be translated patience. And that your deeds of late are greater than at first. Now, do you remember what the criticism or the condemnation of um, Ephesus was? Anybody? They lost their first love. Okay, you've left your first love. Ephesus, according to the letter, started strong and ended weak. It would sound like Thyatira started weak and ended strong. That this church is actually gaining strength and in these areas is to be commended. That your deeds of late are greater than at, at first. So Thyatira was growing stronger. Okay, now, here's the condemnation. I have against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Okay, uh, so that, a couple of things here. Um, in the Old Testament, when Israel, Israel was guilty of idolatry against God, what did God often accuse them of? Adultery. Adultery. Exactly right. There is a parallel between idolatry and the betrayal of God and our relationship with him just as in a marriage, adultery would be a betrayal of the relationship that exists between a husband and a wife. And so uh, the question mark for us is whether this particular Jezebel is leading them indeed to participate because as we've seen in other letters already, uh, and uh, you've, we've talked about the Nicolaitans, uh, and I also had mentioned to you, I think, when John wrote his gospel, um, he was actually responding to the threat of the Gnostics, people who claimed special knowledge or special revelation. And one of their revelations was that the body and the spirit are separate. And I can do whatever I want to with the body and it won't hurt the spirit. And uh, there was a common philosophy of that age called Epicureanism. Uh, actually, there were two dominant philosophies that were mentioned in the book of Acts. 
One was Epicureanism and the other is Stoicism. Okay? The interesting contrast is Epicureans believed that as long as I keep my spirit pure, I can do anything I want to with my body and it doesn't count. Now the Stoics, on the other hand, believed that the way to build up my spirit is to punish my body. And so the Stoics would deprive themselves, would beat themselves, would otherwise uh, punish themselves physically, believing that by putting down the physical nature, they were elevating the spiritual nature. I have to confess to you, if I were a first century Christian, I would have been an Epicurean. <laughs> okay? Uh, and so this was a very enticing philosophy and taught under the guise of this is God's will for you. Whether you go out and carouse and drink on Friday night or Saturday night has no bearing with what you do in church on Sunday. And in a culture where there were so many opportunities, uh, like we talked about Pergamum last week, for these pagan rituals and for uh, some of the pagan temples to even offer um, prostitutes in the guise as priestesses, what we're not certain of is whether Jezebel is indeed leading them to sexual immorality in that vein, or whether what we're really talking about here is someone that's leading them into idolatry and away from their allegiance to Jesus Christ. If someone would, read 1 Kings 16 for us. If you brought your Bible, uh, somebody just look it up. 1 Kings 16, verses 29 through 33. Okay? Now Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. It came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, that he married Jezebel the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went to serve Baal and worshipped him. So he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he he built in Samaria. Ahab also made the Asherah. Thus Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Okay. The great orator preacher R.G. Lee, who was pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee until the 1960s, announced that Ahab was the toad that squatted upon the throne of Israel and that Jezebel was the evil consort that he brought along with him, along with her pagan gods and rituals. Now, for Ahab to build a temple to Baal, or Baal, in Samaria, what's the significance of that? What was Samaria at that time? The capital of Israel. By that time, the kingdoms had split. Jerusalem was the capital of Judah. Samaria was the capital of Israel. And the Israelites, after the kingdom split, had built a temple in Samaria. Do you remember the woman at the well who, as a Samaritan, asked Jesus? Now, you say down on that mountain in Jerusalem is where you worship. We say on this mountain here is where we worship, okay? And that's the background of that. So Ahab brings Jezebel and Jezebel's paganism into the capital city of Samaria and even builds a temple to Baal there. So we're seeing that Jezebel, and, and uh, uh, raise your hand if you have a daughter named Jezebel. <laughs> you know, most of us wouldn't even name a dog Jezebel. Because it's, you know, it's like the name Judas Iscariot, or it's like Benedict Arnold. They're just certain names that history just steers you away from, okay?
Okay? So Jezebel is one of those names. And when we use the name Jezebel, we're associating a certain lifestyle or a certain sin with that name. See? Judas was a betrayer. Benedict Arnold was um, uh, a betrayer. You know, uh, and, and so when we, when we think about Jezebel in the Old Testament, it wasn't so much sexual immorality as it was idolatry. Now, he says in verse 21, I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. Okay. Now, a couple of things here real quick. One, this Jezebel, and, and we don't know if indeed it was a single woman or a group. Um, uh, you know, it, it certainly points to an individual. And ladies, with apologies to you, men have just as much ability to be a Jezebel as a woman does. Uh, but in this case, it is obviously a female to whom he is alluding. But the problem is she is unlike the threats that were outside the church in Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamon. We believe in the context of the letter, Jezebel was inside the church and she was perverting the church from within. And so uh, much like the Jezebel of First Kings did when she brought her paganism and her idols, uh, uh, Baal and Asherah, uh, and built uh, a temple to them, or had Ahab to build a temple to them. Um, that was, was her sin. But notice in verse 22, it carries with it that continued metaphor of sexual immorality. My point is, we're still not sure if that is true or if that is actually uh, a reference or a symbol of idolatry which was really Jezebel um, of the Old Testament. Now, somebody remind us, let me check my time. Somebody remind us, what was Jezebel guilty of in 1 Kings? Besides the idolatry, okay? Well, I think one thing she did was to uh, uh, encourage her husband, the king, to take the field of the vineyard. The vineyard that he wanted. Of Naboth. I remember doing that. I don't know. Oh. Ahab went to Naboth and wanted to buy his vineyard. <coughs> and Naboth replied, it is my father's father's vineyard. It has been in our family and I cannot sell it. And Ahab went back to the palace and like any self-respecting king, climbed up on his face to the wall and started crying. <laughs> and Jezebel came in. And with respect to Dr. R.G. Lee, uh, he had a way of, of imicking her voice. Don't you worry, Ahab. I'll get Naboth's vineyard for you. And so what did she do? She worked out a scheme, and she found false witnesses who said that late Naboth was guilty of a crime against God. And so they stoned Naboth, and she got Naboth's vineyard. And Samuel, who was the last of the judges and the first of the prophets, came into Ahab's court as the prophet of God and said, Naboth's blood cries out. And because of your sin against God and against Naboth, the dogs will lick your blood. And Jezebel, you will die a terrible death. And your children will suffer with you. And if somebody would read for us 2 Kings 9, and I think I made a mistake there and I apologize for that. Let me turn to 2 Kings 9, and, and uh, I see I copied it and then didn't change the numbers, so I apologize for that. Let me get over there. Oh, 
Okay. When Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this, he fled by the way of the garden house, and Jehu pursued him and said, him too in the chariot. It gets bloody here. So they shot him at the ascent of Gur, which is at Ibliam, but he fled to Megiddo and died there. Then his servants carried him in a chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in his grave with his fathers in the city of David. Now in the eleventh year of Joram, the son of Ahab, Ahaziah became king over Judah. When Jehu came to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. Now by this time, Ahab is dead. He was slain, and they drove the chariot to the walls of the city, and he died in his chariot, and the dogs literally licked his blood. So it was a literal fulfillment of Samuel's prophecy against Ahab. When Jehu came to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her eyes and adorned her head and looked out the window. And as Jehu entered the gate, she said, Is it well, Zimri, your master's murderer? Then he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? And two or three officials looked down at him, and he said, Throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and he trampled her underfoot. When he came in, he ate and drank, and he said, See now to this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. So he's saying to his servants, Go out and get the body and Treat it respectfully. Bury it. Okay. And they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Therefore they turned and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the property of Jezreel, the dog shall eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the corpse of Jezebel shall be as dung on the face of the field in the property of Jezreel, so they cannot say, this is Jezebel. There was nothing left to point to. And so in a very, and, and by the way, I apologize. I said Samuel, it was Elijah. Uh, and so we have this, this terrible fate exactly. So when we come back to here, he says, Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. She was given the opportunity to repent and refused. So the repentance now is for those who have become involved with her or who have become influenced by her within the body of the church there. And uh, this woman has... has done apparently terrible damage within the church by misleading others just like the Jezebel of the Old Testament. And so uh, we're seeing that, that the same pronouncement of judgment is upon her. Uh, if we read on in chapter uh, 10 of 2 Kings, in fact, when you get home, if you have trouble sleeping, uh, you might look to 2 Kings chapter 10 because 70 of Ahab and Jezebel's children were slain. Their heads were cut off, their heads were put in a basket, and they were set outside the gates of the city of Jezreel to let folks know the punishment that God exacted upon the house of Ahab. So, okay? So that's when we, when we see the name Jezebel, that's the kind of imagery it calls up, okay? And so, uh, and... It's in 2 Kings 9, 30 through 37. I apologize for my earlier mistake. Okay, now the correction. He says, but I say to you, the rest of you who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. And so he's giving them both a commendation and a warning, okay? Preserve the fellowship, hold to, to uh, uh, 
uh, the doctrine. Uh, don't be misled by this woman or this particular uh, group of people, whether they were the Gnostics, the Nicolaitans, or what, uh, that were perverting the gospel and misleading the church. Now, question, comment? Okay, almost done. Here's the challenge. He who overcomes, and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. As I also have received authority from my father, and I will give him the morning star. Now, when you see a passage of scripture with all capital letters, what's it telling you? Anybody? Sorry, say it out loud. Quoting the Old Testament, okay? So Psalm 2.9 is an exact quote of that which you see in all caps. So Jesus is quoting from Psalm chapter 2 when he makes that statement. And the reference to the morning star, if you go over to uh, Revelation 22, and if somebody would look up and read verse 16 for us, please. Anybody? Verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the church. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Okay, so the reference to the bright and morning star is repeated in the end of Revelation. As you know, chapter 22 is the last chapter of that book. So, okay, and then as we've seen before, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay. These are the churches. Here's Thyatira. Over here is Patmos. Okay. If we went over here, oh, there's Philippi there. And and uh, uh, I was thinking Troas was marked on there, but I don't see it. Troas would have been somewhere right around here. It was a coastal city. And so when Paul went to Philippi, he went across like that. Okay. Now, we've talked about interpreting the letter. I believe that the letter has historical significance to an actual church, real people. And I tend to believe that Jezebel was a real person rather than a metaphor. There have been times through the years in my ministry that I have been dubitably impressed by what certain individuals are capable it doesn't take a lot of people to create a lot of trouble in a church. That's just the sad truth. Okay? And so uh, I believe that there is a historical significance to the church of Thyatira, but I also believe that there is a message for us. And so we conclude, as we have the others, what is God saying to our church from the letter to Thyatira? What do you hear God saying to you out of that letter? Anybody? Be a Dudley do right. I'm sorry? Be a Dudley do be a right. Dude, be a, okay. Be a Dudley do right. You have to watch cartoons with your grandkids to understand that better. <laughs> yes, I agree. Okay. Be aware of people who will lead you astray. Okay. And there are often people who will say, I know what the Bible says, but. And, uh, and that's a dead giveaway. Um, and so, uh, you know, and unfortunately, in some cases, they are people who, in their own mind, in a twisted sort of way, think they're really trying to help. See? They don't see themselves as hurting the work of their church uh, or hurting others or in some twisted way, they may justify their actions because of someone else's action toward them. Well, he did, or she said, or, you know, and on and on it goes, and therefore this is what I did. And so um, we always need to be vigilant. As I shared in my message this morning, we are, each of us, ambassadors for Christ. And therefore, in our interactions in our church and with others out in our community, to remind ourselves that there are people 
who judge Jesus by what they see in us. And we have a, uh, a perpetual responsibility to imitate Christ. And, uh, and as Paul said over in 2 Corinthians 5, as though he beseeches you through us, saying what Jesus would have said if he were here, doing what Jesus would have done if he were here. Paul says that should be the ultimate goal of a Christian. And I believe that's what John is saying to the church at Thyatira. Okay. I appreciate everybody being here. Hope you enjoyed the pizza. I enjoyed some of the chocolate chips that I discovered back there while Johnny was leading your singing. And uh, somebody asked me one time, why do you go back there and eat while we're singing? Don't you like to sing? Well, the honest truth is, if I wait till I get up here to eat, I won't eat anything. So I eat while you're singing so I can come up here and, uh, and talk. That's the only reason. And so some of it was pretty good back there. Okay, that being said, uh, I appreciate everyone being here. They are saying that there will be below freezing temperatures and snow the next weekend. We shall see what we shall see, shan't we? St. Francis had a saying to his followers, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Okay, I like that. And second, uh, to your previous announcement earlier tonight uh, from Rhonda, I had been texting her, the teacher who died uh, was a woman named Holly Foley. She was late 30s, early 40s. Was it an illness or an accident? She didn't say. Okay. okay. Uh, I know she had said some of my kids may have had her. In fact, Alex did have her freshman year. Okay. Uh, well, it's always always tragic. Sam and, uh, and Savannah went to grade school with super kids over tropical. Yeah, and Rhonda had asked for our prayers. Okay. Anything else? I appreciate everyone being here tonight. Rich, glad to have you and Shelba back from the snowy climbs of Colorado. They didn't bring it with them. And we're, yeah, we're glad you left it there. Impressive pictures, but I felt no sympathy whatsoever. I, I must confess. Hey, lead us in our benediction. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the Amen. Amen indeed.